are luxury, romance, and money in motion. They are as exclusive as a private jet and as expensive as a mobile mansion. For the craftsmanship make these cars a Rolls Royce of rail cars. Opulent, elegant, one of a kind vintage rail cars hitching a ride, transporting train travel from a time gone by into the 21st century. All aboard! We're about to take you for an incredible ride on board the most unusual, the most over-the-top rail cars in America. There's only one place on Earth where California, Utah, and Kansas come together. It's on the American Railway Explorer line. Three custom cars. Tricked out to be better today than the day they were built. I think that people will look at these cars and say, this is the way it, it should have been. Maybe it wasn't the way it ever was. They don't look like 1950, but boy, if you could have done it right, this is how they would have been. Jim Bain, president of the American Railway Explorer Line, says the California, Utah, and Kansas first came together in Colorado, all from different railroads. They were used as part of the ski train through the Rockies. Today, the three cars look like a matching set, and they charter for thousands of dollars apiece. I don't think that you would ever notice that these three cars, the Utah, the California, and the Kansas, would have fit together at all. The California domed car originally ran from Chicago to Seattle on the Northern Pacific Railway. The Kansas was the private car of the president of the Rio Grande Railroad. And the Utah, originally built in 1948, was a coach car for the Rock Island Railroad. Later, it sold to the Casablanca Ceiling Fan Company and was converted into a traveling showroom. You can imagine there were ceiling fans throughout this car. It's kind of scary for tall people. It traveled the country showing off their product line. When we acquired it, we converted it into this uh, beautiful lounge car. This is how the Utah used to look. And this is how it's been reconfigured today. More than a half a million bucks later. Well, we ripped out everything, took it down to its bare walls, and then uh, started laying in all this nice mahogany. And the ceiling was reconfigured to be like this with these little drop panels above. And all the mechanical systems were renewed, too. We built in the bar down at the other end, too. It didn't have a bar before. And Jim says no matter where the train tracks lead the Utah, its bar is now called best bar in town. The Utah, along with the California and the Kansas, now look like they were made for each other. And that's all by design. There was a great deal of influence from the Orient Express. Owner had gone over and had ridden the Orient Express and came back with a vision of how he wanted these cars to be. So we created cars that looked like the Orient Express, but in America. There was only one person who could make that happen. Mr. James Park of London was involved with the renovation of the Vent Simplon Orient Express train. And so we had him come over and he did the architecture for these cars. All three cars are decked out in deep, dark mahogany. Accented with a bird's eye maple. A rare combination that you may not be able to find anywhere else. We take a lot of pride in that. The woods, as we understand now, would be almost impossible to get because the hardwoods are so hard to find anymore. Even the partition doors that separate the sleepers in the California are made out of mahogany. Beautiful and still functional. One of the great things about these suites in the California car, they're master suites, this wall can be moved back and folded away to create a much larger room. This bed would fold down, and this bed actually drops down out of the ceiling, so you'd sleep four people in this room. 
the wood is only part of the Orient Express package. No detail was left undone. Everything is patterned after the original. All these carpets and the fabrics here were all imported from Holland. It's mohair, and it's the same type that they use in a Rolls Royce. The carpets themselves were specially woven for us with a pattern that we designed in England and brought over. There are even real pieces of the Orient Express on board. The draperies, these little table lamps were all from the Orient Express as well, so it emulates it quite well. They may look like sisters, but they are definitely not identical triplets. The California could be the prettiest of the three. It sleeps 16 and has a dome like no other private car on the tracks today. There's several of them that run across the nation, but uh, ours is the prettiest. Most of the domers running the rails today use metal to frame the giant windows. The California is carved wood. The woodworkers are amazing to me. I mean, how they can create something like this. And it wasn't really bent wood, they were carved pieces of wood. So you start with a very large piece and carve it down into just the curve that you need here. It was just a lot of a small workmanship. And as you kind of notice around here, there really aren't any nail holes or any kind of way that, how did they hold this whole thing together? Blind joints and stuff that they did in here, that, it's a mystery to me. One mystery Jim can clear up is how dome cars were born. They were modeled after the old planes from World War II. The Vista Dome was actually invented in the Glenwood Canyon in Colorado. A locomotive engineer was going through and enjoying this magnificent view through the canyon and thought there ought to be a way for passengers to enjoy this too. So he had had some military experience with uh, B-52s or something, you know, had this curved glass idea, and so he adapted that to a rail car and they created the Vista Dome. The California has the best view. The Utah is the party car. But the Kansas has a platform where the rich and famous have stood. In 1996, the World Economic Summit came to Denver, and so they were looking for something to do with the spouses of the world leaders. And we were chosen to take them up to Winter Park for a luncheon. So all the first ladies, and one of those being Hillary Clinton. We've also had Neil Young, Seal, and a few other stars on the train, too. These three fabulous cars are all stars in their own right. Heavenly works of art with the devil in the detail. One of the great details of the cars is this exquisite marquetry work that they did. These are inlaid pieces of wood that were all done in England. This is the Sergo Lily, which is the state flower for Utah, which is the, this car that we're in. The other cars, the California has the poppy. Kansas has the sunflower. The Kansas also has tulips lighting up the lounge and etched in the glass. One more little thing about these cars that helps us remember the elegance of the past and sets a new standard for excellence. We think that the craftsmanship and the woodwork and all the little details make these cars are more like a Rolls Royce of rail cars. The California Zephyr is a picture postcard in motion. At sunset, the glass Vista domes serve as a canopy to a kaleidoscope sky. Colors explode as the sleek silver cars streak down the California coastline. But the Zephyr first hit the rails in the days of black and white, back in 1948. Like old man river itself, the California Zephyr keeps rolling along. It was the missing link between east and west. The California Zephyr ran from the San Francisco Bay to Chicago. It was once known as the most glamorous train in America. I think it was part of a wow factor. Bert Hermy is restoring three of the California Zephyr's original cars. The Silver Lariat, a dining car. The Silver Solarium, a Vista View dome. And the Silver Rapids, 
a sleeper car. The Zephyr was first retired from the rails in 1980. And Bird says these beautiful cars were in desperate need of repair. They were really rough, all of them. At some point during its retirement, there were transients that were in here. One pair of chairs had been burned. Amtrak welded the doors shut, and welded bars over the windows in an attempt to prevent that from continuing. And I guess they were successful. It took us a day or so to get into the car, too. So. And once Bert and his crew broke through the bars, the cars were even in worse shape than he originally thought. The upholstery had been sliced and torn. And up here in the dome, it had uh, rotted because of the sun. It took four years and plenty of money to restore these spectacular cars of the Zephyr back to their former glory. This car, we've got between four and 500,000 in it. That's mostly materials cost, because both my partner and I are pretty hands-on. There are some things that we've had to contract out, but not really all that many. If it were to go into a shop, it would have been double that. Despite the damage, some of the signature beauty items of the grand old cars were still there, including the original lighted Lucite banisters. That's the first thing that people see when they walk in the car. They go, oh, I remember those. Wow, I'm so glad he kept them. Bert and his crew were also able to preserve the old speaker grills. The grills were designed by artist Mary Losser, who also painted a large mural in the Silver Lariat that still looks picture perfect. It's one of very few that still remain. And she did much of the artwork in several trains, but each one of the dome coaches had a mural that depicted some aspect of life in the West. Since these cars were built for a specific train, California Zephyr. The murals focused on aspects of Western life that romanticized the whole going West experience. Uh, this one was called the Pony Express. Right behind that mural is a brand new kitchen. It's a new part of this grand old car that Bert put in when he turned the glassed Vista Dome into a car of fine dining for paying passengers. Dinner is now being served. In the Clifford McDaniel was a porter for decades and now dresses up the Lariat's dining room. Enjoy your dinner. I still enjoy it because I like making people comfortable and making them happy. And I want them to remember the experience that they had. So I like to kind of be like an ambassador. Cliff says the food on the Lariat is fantastic, but the train adds the true flavor. Just look out the window on either side. You see America. And what more pleasant way to enjoy the scenery than from a train window. The Lariat's dining car is new, but Bert says he's gone to great lengths to preserve the elegance of days gone by. The car has its own monogram china, a lot of touches that people remember from way back when. It sort of paints a picture of the way things were way back in the day. The Silver Rapids is a sleeper car with six double bedrooms and 10 roomettes. They've been completely restored and still convert from a sitting room to a bedroom in a matter of minutes. When the bed comes down, the sink folds up and flushes out the side of the train. The sink is very similar to what you might see in an older cruise ship or something. It empties by folding it up into its stowed position. The Silver Solarium combines slumber and spectacular views. This Vista Dome car has a cocktail bar, a lounge, and six upscale bedrooms. You get two beds, upper and lower, a closet that will handle half a dozen garments on hangers. You get a bathroom with a toilet and a sink in it, hot and cold running water. You get seating area for two or three people when it's in day service. If guests wish to eat in their rooms, there are Pullman tables available. They're quite versatile cars. Another one of the hidden jewels of the solarium is the elaborate artwork of the bar. The bar is original. It has its original hard linoleum front. The original paint job on it still exists under the paint job that's there now. And it would be our hope one day to restore it. It's a wonderful piece of artwork. Just like the rest of the California Zephyr. 
that is a bygone piece of Americana. These simply aren't available anymore. Preserving the car is also a means of preserving a bygone era of service. Enjoy your dinner. Bon appetit. Panache that you're just not going to see today. Expensive private rail car is plenty. But for owner Patrick Henry, railroad cars are a little like potato chips. He couldn't have just one. I had the opportunity to purchase a train car and I basically lost my head. Patrick not only lost his head, but also his heart to these two beautiful rail cars. I was going to buy one car and I ended up buying two cars. Today, those cars are known as the Evelyn Henry, named after Patrick Henry's mother, and the Warren R. Henry, in memory of his father. Well, my father was a railroad man for 41 years on the Santa Fe Railroad, and that's where I fell in love with trains. He would always take us on his inspection trips, and we'd get to do the fine dining, and I was so fortunate when I was a child, I traveled on the back of trains for almost, it seemed like, every summer. Now, Patrick can relive those summertime trips aboard his very own matching pair of tricked-out rail cars, a passion that Patrick shares with his friends and family that come aboard. The elegant interior of the Warren R. Henry Dome car was inspired by legendary architect Frank Lloyd Wright and originally completed in 1955. Packed inside is a full kitchen, dining room, and a spacious lounge on the main level. Upstairs flashes with snapshots of America zooming by. Here in the main dining room, the car's pampered passengers can take their meals in high style while bathing in the soothing glow of this massive, one-of-a-kind lighting fixture. I think a lot of people, when they first come on board, is they don't understand just how elegant these train cars can be. Patrick has worked hard to restore the elegance. This picture shows the beautiful dining room table was missing when he first got the Warren Henry. So I went and researched where the table was. And he eventually found it, collecting dust in a Seattle garage. I brought it back to what it should have looked like originally when it was built. The nearby glass-fronted china cabinets featured doors adorned with stunning leaded glass that matched the opulent overhead lighting fixture. In this cabinet here, we house all of our signature glassware. Onboard service manager, Cashley Greenwood says literally everything is tightly tucked away. Everything here, as you can see, has a slot. So this one is designed specifically for the smaller glasses. We have the wine glasses here, which has a larger slot. Among the treasures, stemware from the luxurious Super Chief service, which ran halfway across the country, from Chicago to LA. And now we come to an innovation of luxury travel unique in modern railroading. The Super Chief was operated by the Santa Fe Railroad, where Patrick once worked. And his father, Warren, built a career. The ultimate in comfort and luxury. The parlor provides a panoramic view and comfy seating. There are plush sofas and love seats and swivel chairs that let you chat with friends as you sit back and watch the world go by. Tucked right around the corner, a modern beverage station with its very own well-stocked wine fridge. The gourmet dinner and all the other delicious food is prepared right here in this mini but mighty kitchen. Special latches keep plates in place as the car rips down the rail. And the chef whips up delicacy after delicacy. They're thinking you're going to get a little box lunch of a turkey sandwich, and next thing they know, they're getting shrimp wraps or lobster tail. And so I think people are amazed by the quality of the food that's cooked on board. For dinner, guests are treated to an amazing four-course, five-star feast complete with personalized menus and a choice of fine wines, craft beers, and handcrafted cocktails. 
I usually come home a little bit heavier, though, than, <laughs> so I have to die in a few days after we get off the train trip. Terry Graham, Patrick's girlfriend, may hate jumping on the diet train, but loves riding the rails. It's so relaxing. I'm used to doing air travel because I'm a flight attendant. In air travel, the destination is what's important. Well, train travel is the opposite of that. You don't really care about the destination. You enjoy every minute of being on the rails, looking out the window, relaxing, having your dinner, having your lunch, and enjoying every moment of the ride. And when it's finally time to turn in, Terry and the other guests make their way to the Evelyn Henry. Patrick's beautiful private sleeping car was built in 1954 and sleeps up to 14 people in one master suite and six double bedrooms. I think one of the best parts of riding on the train is the rocking motion. We have so many people tell us they sleep better on the train than they do in their own house because of the slow rocking motion. The double bedrooms feature private vanities with hand linens and essential toiletries and direct access to a semi-private bath with all the amenities, including tiled showers. And for those who demand the best of the best, there's the Grand Canyon. The deluxe master suite with a spacious brass bed for two, plush quilted bedding, and a totally private master bath where you can enjoy a hot, relaxing shower. And then slip between the covers and let the rhythm of the rails rock you to sleep. It's the one time that you get away from all the problems, all the challenges, is when you get on a train and you wake up in the morning to the smell of bacon and the sleeper. It's the one time that you just really get to enjoy yourself and see America like no one else can. And you see it from ground level and you're not seeing it from 35,000 feet. And then to be able to experience it on a private train car, it just doesn't get any better than that. Ever wonder where the phrase, the red carpet treatment, came from? Well, here's a clue. The 20th Century Limited train line was the first to roll it out in 1938. The royal red carpet stretched the length of a football field, from the engine room to the observation car, and hosted the most famous feat of its day. The 20th Century Limited was the most famous train in the world because it operated on a very, very fast schedule between New York and Chicago. So it carried all the movie stars, corporate executives, money moguls. From there, people would get on the Super Chief and go to L.A. The 20th Century Limited was not only used by movie stars, it was used in the Hitchcock thriller, North by Northwest, with Eva Marie Saint and Cary Grant. But this so-called train to the tycoon's most famous role was as America's first unofficial bullet train. We're going 90 miles an hour. Remember, automobiles didn't travel at that speed on interstate highways. They were traveling on two-lane roads throughout the United States for probably 50 miles an hour or so. So this was fast. Raymond Klaus now owns the company which manages the Hickory Creek. A car from the 20th Century Limited line customized by revolutionary designer Henry Dreyfus. Henry Dreyfus designed everything from matchbook covers to advertisements to furnishings, blankets, special silverware design. Henry Dreyfus designs are a part of America's fabric. They include telephones, vacuum cleaners, thermostats, the Polaroid camera, and even a steam iron that, not surprisingly, looks like a locomotive. Henry Dreyfus designed a streamlined steam locomotive, which was the Hudson style, one of the most famous engines on the New York Central Railroad. The unique thing about this car is the Dreyfus furniture layout. Dreyfus wanted to bring in that New York club atmosphere into his equipment that warm feeling. He wanted to use earth tones. Wanted his people to feel very comfortable in the environment that he recreated in these cars. All of Dreyfus's genius was almost destroyed in 1967 when the Hickory was sold. 
the grand old car had been reconfigured, then gutted by the time Raymond rescued it in 1992. You can see from the outline on the floor where the old rooms had been. The car was on the scrap line in Palmetto, Florida. They really didn't care about it anymore, and the vandals got to it, and they stole things out of the inside of the car, and they graffitied up the inside of the car and uh, broke windows. I remember looking at the car and saying to my father, you're nuts. You cannot restore this. It should be razor blades. Raymond's son, Scott, tried to talk his dad out of restoring the Hickory Creek but soon found it would become a family project. In fact, Scott did a lot of the electrical work himself. A lot of sweat, a lot of blood, busted knuckles, and memories rebuilding that car. The car was in unbelievable condition. There were no windows in it. The outside of the body was rotted out. The trucks were in terrible condition. The floor pan was completely rotted through. We had to go to the Pullman archives and find all the original drawings so we could rebuild the car back to its original specifications. It was a monumental task. It took a lot of dedication. It took a lot of engineering. It took a lot of research to get it to the point where it is today. Reproducing the ventilation grills alone cost close to $60,000. And the total restoration took more than five years. Raymond and his team brought the Hickory Creek back to her glory days and beyond. The car was originally designed as a lounge buffet car. So it was only used for drinks and maybe some hors d'oeuvres and things like that. And then people would come back here traditionally listen to the radio, have a smoke, a game of cards with their friends, and enjoy the same ring. This proud piece of the 20th Century Limited line is now ready to ride into the 21st century. The car is currently Amtrak certified for 110 miles an hour, and we've reached that speed of 110 miles an hour with this car. Getting the Hickory back on track was a haul, but for Raymond Klaus and his family, it was a labor of love. A lot of people have asked me, why did you spend five years of your life taking a car that was ready to go to the scrap heap and bring it back? It's a very unique and very historic piece of railroad equipment. I never had a chance to ride the 20th Century Limited. My sons never had a chance to ride the 20th Century Limited. And both my sons have worked on this piece of equipment with me. So it gives me great pride to have my family involved. It's probably the most famous lightweight passenger car in the world right now because it did operate on the most famous train in the world. It's a great way to see America. Every tricked out train is unique and brings something special to town. But this next beauty could be called the ringleader. Ladies and gentlemen, children of all ages, step right up to the greatest show, Unearthed. It's the private, opulent, luxury train car. The John Ringling Road when the most famous circus in the world came to town. John Ringling was one of four other brothers that created the great entertainment empire, the Ringling Brothers Circus. Deborah Walk, curator of the Circus Museum, says this spectacular car was a huge step up from the wagon train days of the greatest show on earth. It's very hard for us to appreciate the event of the circus coming to town. Basically, at the turn of 1900, we had three major holidays. Christmas, the 4th of July, and when the circus came to town. The 79-foot-long, 65-ton Pullman car is named the Wisconsin, after the Ringling's home state. John Ringling was the advanced person. He would make sure all the contracts were in line so that when the show came to town, there was no doubt, no problem. John and his wife Mabel used the lavish rail car to travel across the country from 1905 to 1916. 
this was his car. It wasn't owned by the circus. The Wisconsin is a picture of elegance and design. John Ringling handpicked everything inside, from the rich inlaid mahogany walls to the ornate moldings, to the detailed stained glass windows, even the gold leaf trimmed ceilings. And the cast iron kitchen was state of the art for its time. But this grand old car was more than just derailed after John Ringling sold it in 1916. It was nearly destroyed. And Deborah Walk took a video camera on board to document the damage. This is the dining room, all original. This wonderful Fabergé jewel of a car was used as a fishing camp in Mooreshead City, North Carolina. Thankfully, the car was saved just in the nick of time. We had water damage in this part. Yeah, yeah. And that's why this has not been worked on at all. It's because they were afraid it was going to drop and we would lose all the decorative yeah. work. Just imagine, if you can, these walls painted a white seven layers of paint on it. When I came in for the first time, it was all boarded up, so you couldn't see anything. And this was the only piece of the work that was available to look at. You couldn't see anything of this beautiful mahogany, except for the one piece of marquetry, which is over my shoulder. But that patch of mahogany heaven was just enough to keep hope alive that the Wisconsin could be saved. But it wasn't just the walls. These beautiful ceilings were also smothered in thick white paint. And so the ceilings were sanded down very carefully, just like in the tree rings, going back, looking at the different colors, getting to the gesso stage, and realized the next paint up was the color that the ceilings were originally done. When we got that work done, then we brought it here to the Ringling Museum. And that was a process in itself. Because we're in a building, uh, 180 feet of rail had to be laid to bring the car from the outside inside. Once inside the Ringling Museum in Sarasota, Florida, there was no turning back. I walked in and realized that in spite of the lime green shag carpet, that this was a project that had to be taken on. What is this? Isn't this beautiful? It just exudes two people, John and Mabel Ringling. More than $400,000 was spent to bring the Wisconsin back to life. The restoration was meticulous in detail and history. We were able to get the blueprints. We were able to find builders' photos. The beautiful, detailed moldings on either side of the ceiling had been cut in half. A team of artists handmade special resin molds to magically piece them back together. But they might have had a little help from above. I really do think that the ringlings are looking down over our shoulder because even though they destroyed all of the medallions going through the car, we had a left and we had a right, and so that we could put the medallions back together again. The crew that meticulously put the Wisconsin back together left no detail undone right down to the carpet. The rug you will see is a reproduction that was made by the same company in England, the Wilton Company. And so we were able to find a 1909 carpet sample of all places, eBay, and be able to have it rewoven to give this real sense of warmth and color that the car has. With all that's been done, it's safe to say, bringing the Wisconsin back to life has been more work than, well, a three-ring circus. I think one other thing that everyone needs to know about this car is that about 80% of what you see here is original. Incredible, a car over 100 years old, we're only missing one window piece. Incredible statement 
of how this was just meant to be restored. If you are ever standing on a corner in Winslow, Arizona, there truly is quite a fine sight to see. It's not a girl in a flatbed Ford. It's a private rail car named the Lewis Sock Alexis. They say the first time is always special, and this was the first car. It's got a lot of history. I mean, I watched my kids grow up as we built the car. So it does have a lot of special meaning to me. Mike Solwitz is a doctor, but he's the first one to tell you he should have had his head examined for buying the Sock Alexis. I bought it because I was ignorant. This particular car was my first foray into railroad private car rebuilding, and I didn't know any better. I was enamored with the car. I liked the history of the car. I've always liked the Pennsylvania Railroad, but I liked lounge cars and bedroom, so it had a little of both. But if I had it to do over again, I would have never bought this car. Subsequently, I bought three or four other cars and learned that what I had to do on this car was monumental compared to what most people have to do on their cars. When Mike first bought the car in 1980, he thought it was a steal, especially at the price. Don't let this get out, $1,000, which I had to justify to my wife, who thought I had lost my mind, and maybe I did. And then it's been a series of checks ever since. <laughs> you see, back then, the Sock Alexis was not nearly the beauty it is today. In fact, the doctor says if the private rail car had been one of his patients, he would have told the ER nurse to prepare the family for the worst. I would tell them, uh, you know, notify the family that the chance of this patient making it is probably one in a thousand. The Sock Alexis first hit the rails in the late 1940s as part of the Spirit of St. Louis on the Pennsylvania Railroad. It was a car on their flagship train from St. Louis to New York. Mike and his family spent three years working to rebuild the Sock Alexis. Then he moved his medical practice and was forced to sell his very first precious private car. I was busy setting up my practice and really didn't have the time to devote to the car, so I thought I probably should sell it. Maybe later on I'll get into another car. Another car? Or the same car? Yep, Mike never lost track of his first love, and in 1994, believe it or not, he made a trade offer to get the Sock Alexis back. I've got this Mercedes. Would you be interested in trading the Mercedes for a railroad car? And we dickered back and forth for several months. I think I threw in a Jeep and a trailer as well. And we did the trade. My wife comes to see the car that she traded her Mercedes for, and all she can see is an empty car that looked just like it did when we sold it. But Mike knew something his wife didn't know. The guy he got it back from had spent a ton of money to rebuild the undercarriage of the car. He bought the car, and then he proceeded to literally rebuild this car structurally from the ground up. There are photos that show the car devoid of floors and walls. And you're looking at the main center beam of the car with the earth down below it as they stripped everything out and then put it back together. Today, the Sock Alexis is a picture of Art Deco perfection. The luxury lounge, once in ruins, is now littered with railroad classics. Etched glass reflects this grand car's glory days. This sandblasting was taken off of a Pennsylvania Railroad schedule from the late 1940s. One of Mike's greatest treasures is this replica of an old radio he and his grandfather used to listen to Cleveland Indian baseball games. The name Louis Sock Alexis was the Penobscot Indian who lived in Maine, who was a baseball player for, at that time, for the Cleveland Spiders. They later became the Cleveland Naps in honor of Napoleon Lajouet. And then in 1912, the Indians was the name that was picked in honor of Louis Sock Alexis. 
The Sock Alexis celebrates the past, but embraces the future. The cold metal walls have been replaced with warm wood. Two of the three bedrooms have been converted to mirror one another. They now have bunk beds and bookshelves. And there's a shiny new stainless steel kitchen. A labor of love that's turned a $1,000 investment into a lot of blood, sweat, and money. There's well over a half a million dollars in the car. And any private car owner in the country will not blink an eye with that figure because they know what it takes to rebuild the car. Could you bleep that out for my wife? <laughs> Mike Solwitz says his wife has actually been with him every step of the way. Even designed the special cabin doors. A lot of people remark about the wooden doors, and then we have to tell them that these are metal doors that my wife managed to put a faux finish on. But it was Mike's passion that wouldn't let the Sock Alexis die. It must be the doctor in him. The great pleasure I got out of having this car and the others was to be able to bring back to life something that was going to the scrap heap and see it run again.